Well, let me say a very warm welcome to St. Ebb's Church here in the heart of Oxford, UK. And this is our church building. It's a rather lovely church building, actually mostly built in the early 19th century. Although there's been a church on this particular site, right in the heart of Oxford, for over 1,300 years. And uh, it's lovely to have you at least virtually with us. I'm sorry, obviously I can't be with you live. And uh, I'm going to be joining through technology anyway, live for the Q&A a little bit later. What a privilege to be with you on this occasion. I have such happy memories of being with you five years ago. I met some old friends on that occasion, others I met for the first time, and uh, I hold your diocese in very high regard. I thank the Lord for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus, and it's wonderful to have fellowship with you across the, uh, the world and the continents. Your theme is such an important one, Sabbath and Sabbath rest, and that's very much the theme, as you'll be hearing, of the passage that I'm speaking about today, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 4, verse 11, and I hope it'll become clear why I've chosen this passage to speak on. So Andy, my colleague, is going to come up now, and he's going to read from that passage, and then I'm going to preach. So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed entered that rest, enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Thank you, Andy, very much indeed. Let me read again that last verse that we had, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. I'll pray. Loving Father, as the writer goes on to say in the very next verse, your word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And we pray, please, may your word do its work in our lives. 
Let change us where we need to be changed. Encourage us when we need to be encouraged. For your name's sake. Amen. Well, I wonder how you're doing. <laughs> strange, strange times that we live in. And we're very conscious that uh, you in America have been hit hard by the COVID virus. We've been hit very hard here as well. And I think the word unrest really sums up what we're going through at the moment. Unrest. There's unrest wherever you look. Personal unrest. And many people are completely affected deeply by all the restrictions we're under. I think what was happening before COVID struck was a sense of disease. And many, many people feeling that the world is not as it should be. Their, their lives are not as their lives should be. And then COVID has struck. And we've had to reflect on our lives. It's as if uh, there's been a pause button hit. And as we've reflected, many have felt a sense of personal unrest. Things are not as they should be in our lives personally. Then there's very obviously been political unrest and we've followed the elections that have been going on in your own country with great interest. And we've seen the deep divisions that have been revealed politically. And we haven't looked with any real sense of distance actually because they've reflected the, the big differences that we've seen politically in our own country. I, in my lifetime, I've never seen a period in, in the UK where we've been more divided politically, not least over Brexit. So there's been personal unrest, political unrest, social unrest over issues like race and immigration and social injustice. That's bubbled up, of course, throughout the summer in your own country and in mine as well. And this sense of unrest indicates that the world is not as it should be. And wonderfully, to a restless world, God offers the rest that we long for, the rest that we desperately need. And the theme of this section in the writer of the Hebrews is rest. Eleven times the word rest is mentioned. One time, the word Sabbath, translated in my version, the NIV, Sabbath rest. It's the word Sabbath, but these two themes of Sabbath and rest, of course, are intimately related. And wonderfully, the writer is assuming that this rest, this Sabbath rest, is offered to us in Christ. And the great appeal of God through this passage is whatever you do, don't miss out. Don't miss out on God's rest. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the writer to the Hebrews in this particular letter in the New Testament. In its first century context, it was originally written to Jewish believers in Christ. And as you read through the letter, it becomes clear that they began the Christian life really well, despite suffering, they blazed forward wonderfully. But now many of them are wavering. The, the pressure, it seems, not so much active persecution from the state, but social pressure has mounted up. And some of them are wavering. Imagine it like this. I, I don't think the letter was probably written to Jerusalem, but let's imagine it was to Jews in Jerusalem. And there is the temple right at the heart of the city. And imagine it's the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath, everyone in the city is heading down the main road to the temple at the heart of the city, which dominates the skyline. But there are just a few Christians, and they're going in the other direction. They're not joining with everyone else in the temple because they realize that that's been superseded. They've heard about the Lord Jesus Christ who comes to fulfill what was foreshadowed in that building. And so they're no longer going to the temple. They're heading in the other direction against the flow down the main street in the different direction from everyone else. And then they go off down a back street to a house down a little alleyway and maybe a back room at the back of that house where a small little crowd of them are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his church. Well, you can imagine the, the huge social pressure. Their friends and family say, you're mad. Why don't you just come along with everyone else to the temple? And now, as the social pressure is mounting, they're wavering, and some have given up altogether. They've stopped meeting in the, the little back street, and they've joined again in the temple. Others, it seems, were too timing. 
And they were trying to find some kind of way of syncretizing temple worship and the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And the writer's pleading with them throughout this letter, no, don't do it, don't do it. Keep going, persevere. That's the great plea of the letter. Because what you've got in Christ is so much better than what you had before. That word better comes 13 times. It's a plea to persevere. And this section is designed to undergird that plea. It's an exposition of Psalm 95. And notice how it begins, verse 7. So, as the Holy Spirit says. I love that as an introduction to the psalm. As the Holy Spirit says. So straight away there's an assumption that this ancient literature, the psalm, Psalm 95, is not just a human writing, it's God. It's the Holy Spirit who's the ultimate author of Psalm 95. And not only is the psalm God's word, it's God's contemporary word, as the Holy Spirit, present tense, says. And there are two convictions that should undergird our preaching ministry. That the Bible is not just a human book. It's divine. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's not just an ancient book, a kind of record of what God said back then. It's a contemporary book. It's the living word of God for today. Hebrews 4 verse 12, as I mentioned at the beginning of my prayer, the word of God is living and active. And those are convictions that will lead us to a ministry of expounding God's word. I hope that's at the heart of your ministry. As the Holy Spirit says. And then he quotes from the psalm, verse 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the wilderness. Looking back to the time that's described in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, do you remember at the beginning of the book of Numbers, the people of Israel set out on their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. It should not have taken very long. But of course, it does take many years. And the book of Numbers is a very frustrating book. It's a story of disobedience and delay. Instead of going straight there, they meander round and round about. And why are they waiting? They're waiting for that generation to die out because they've lacked faith. They haven't trusted in God and his gospel promises. And so eventually God loses patience and says none of that generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, will enter the land. And so they wander around for years before they get in. And the writer refers back to that incident, the psalmist and the writer of the Hebrews has it in mind and is saying, look, whatever you do, please don't let history repeat itself. Imagine a woman who's grown up in a household where dad was an alcoholic and she's seen alcohol ruin his life, ruin her family's life. Well, then she got married and she's had a son. And as the son is getting older, she sees him turning to, to alcohol. He's getting drunk. He's drinking much too much. And you can imagine her with deep insistence pleading with him, listen, Alcohol destroyed my father's life. Don't let history repeat itself. Don't mess up in the same way. And she speaks with passion. And that's the kind of passion that the writer of the Hebrews is speaking. Chapter 3 and verse 12, here's his application of Psalm 95. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Don't mess up like they did. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Don't make the same mistake. Now, what was uh, relevant as a message to those in the first century is surely still a message relevant for us today. We might initially read the writer of the Hebrews and this letter in the New Testament and think this is rather an alien book unless we happen to come from a Jewish background and most of us don't. So what's this got to do with me? And yet isn't it the case that we too, the moment we turn to Christ, are forced to stop 
going in the direction of everyone else, as it were, down the main street in our community life, but a call to turn around and go in another direction. And if you imagine in that city of Jerusalem, it was the temple that dominated the skyline, and the pressure was on to join with everyone else in going to the temple. What we might say today, it's the temple of individualism, that you must not challenge an individual's right to define who they are and how they want to live, and you dare not raise any questions about that. There's a temple that it seems everyone worships at, or the temple of materialism, or relativism, or pluralism, and how dare you suggest that there's only one way to God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we're following him, we're finding we're heading, as it were, the wrong way down Main Street, in the opposite direction to which everyone else is going. And we're having to go down a back street. Now, of course, in previous generations in our culture, it wasn't a back street, and still in some parts of the U.S., it's entirely normal, especially in the South, it seems to me, to be Christian, even an orthodox committed Christian, but increasingly the tide is changing in your culture. And it's certainly changed in my culture. And those of you who were in the Episcopal Church formerly, you saw that the, the culture changed in your denomination. And you found that if you were standing for the truth of God, even in church life, it felt as if you were going against the mainstream and ending up in a back street as a minority. And that's tough. It has a huge impact emotionally. I find it exhausting to feel all the time I'm going against the culture and how tempting it is just to give up. Maybe you know that temptation in your heart temptation to give up altogether and just join everyone else in worshiping in that temple or to do what many have done in church life sadly and say well let's have a bit of both and let's adapt our religion even call it Christianity but let it fit in with what people are worshiping in our culture today that's the pressure and so the message of Hebrews is a really relevant message to us today keep at it don't give up and you might say, what's this got to do with our theme of these few days on Sabbath? Well, of course, this theme of rest and Sabbath is a huge theme in Hebrews 3 and 4. So before I go back to application, I've given you an indication of how I'm going to be applying this passage. Keep going despite the pressure. Let's just see how the writer engages with the theme of rest. What you have here is fairly sophisticated biblical theology of the theme of Sabbath. Eleven times the word rest comes, once the word Sabbath, and it's used, this word rest, to describe different realities. Chapter 4, verse 1, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Let's be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. In other words, he's talked about a rest in the past, the promised land, but there's another rest that's still to come. So what does he mean when he talks about rest? I think there are four ways in which he speaks of this reality in the passage, and this will give us a sense of a kind of biblical theology, the theme. First, and I think you can see this on your notes, the outline. First, God's rest on the seventh day. That's clearly referred to in chapter 4 and verse 4. For somewhere, God has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. The chapter headings aren't always helpful in the Bible. Uh, they're not original. And certainly one way in which the chapter headings aren't terribly helpful in one place is at the beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1, you've got the six creative days. And they end with the sixth day when human beings are created. And you could get the sense that the climax of creation and, and the climax of the whole account is the creation of humanity on the sixth day. And then chapter 2 begins. And chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, really belong to the previous section. And there you get the description of the seventh day. And actually, this is the climax of it all. This is where it's all heading. With God's rest on the seventh day. God resting. You can get the wrong impression. You get an impression of, of God 
sitting back and, uh, as it were, doing nothing. No, God is still profoundly, actively sustaining creation. But at this point, creation is complete and he can enjoy what he's made and delight in it. It's often been commented on that there's a, a clear pattern all the way through Genesis chapter 1. And you've got the same pattern at the end of each day. There was evening, there was morning, the first day, the second day, the third day, and so on. When you get to the seventh day, chapter 2, verse 3, there's no end to the seventh day. We're not told there was evening, there was morning, the seventh day. No, the seventh day is open-ended. So then when we begin chapter 2, verse 4, with the, the parallel account of creation, with its focus on human beings in the Garden of Eden, what we're invited to imagine is here are human beings, as it were, sharing God's rest, enjoying the perfection of God's creation in perfect harmony with the world around them, with one another, after God creates Eve as the, the helper for Adam, and above all, in perfect harmony with the God who made them. Genesis 2 is a description of life in God's rest. As it were, it's one long Sabbath. Doesn't mean they're not working, but rest seems to have a bigger implication in the light of chapter 2, 1 to 3. It's, it's the perfection of God's creation. But then sin comes in, in Genesis 3, the account of the fall, and unrest enters the world. And that's where the Bible could have ended. But God is a God of infinite grace and love. And even though we turned away from God, in his amazing grace, he comes towards Adam and Eve. He makes promises. And the promises are expanded as you go through the Old Testament, especially the promise to Abraham and beyond. And what God is promising to do is to restore his creation, to restore his rest, if you like, to bring people back into the seventh day that they might enjoy his rest again. But that leads us to the second way in which the word rest is used in this section. As a reference to the promised land. The psalmist in Psalm 95 is certainly meaning us to understand by rest Canaan, the land of Canaan. Chapter 3, verse 11, So I declared on oath in my anger, says God, they shall never enter my rest. There's God's judgment on that generation that they were not to enter the promised land of Canaan. Now that's not, in God's design, the ultimate restoration of rest. What you have in the Old Testament is prophecy. And the whole of the Old Testament is prophetic in that it's pointing forward. Not just the overt prophetic sections where the, the writing prophets are speaking about God's plan in the future. Even the history of Israel in the Promised Land is prophetic because it's pointing beyond itself to a greater reality. It's a model that points to the real thing. And so that Promised Land of Canaan was never in God's design the ultimate rest. It's a pointer to the ultimate rest that lies in the new creation, which Jesus Christ has come to make possible. Joshua led the next generation after Moses' generation had died into the land. And by the time Psalm 95 was written, they'd been there ever since. And yet still the psalmist speaks about a future rest. And he pleads with them not to miss out. Chapter 4, verse 8. If Joshua had given them rest, in other words, when they entered the promised land, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Beyond the promised land. And the big question, of course, is what is this Sabbath rest offered to God's people? And the answer is, it's made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ, partially now and perfectly in the new creation. So it's here now in the present. That at least is implied in chapter 4 and verse 3 at the beginning there. Now we who have believed enter that rest. The unbelieving Israelites didn't enter God's rest in Canaan. 
But those who believe in Christ do enter God's rest. And the implication is it's a present reality. You see, the ultimate reason for the deep unrest within the human soul is separation from God. There's a God-shaped hole in our lives that only he can fill. And many of us had discovered that in reality. You can have all the dreams of your younger lives fulfilled. You can get on in your career, have a really good marriage, live in a very comfortable environment, have all the money you could imagine in your bank balance and still feel there's something missing. Isn't that the, the cry of so many wealthy people? I've met loads of miserable millionaires. Bob Geldof, who was the lead singer with the, uh, the rock group Boomtown Rats, who came up with the concept of Live, at, live Aid, you remember that, that uh, global concert that, that raised millions for charity, became a, a, a massive public figure. He became very wealthy. And yet at the height of his fame, he wrote his autobiography and he called it, Is That It? <laughs> and there are many who are feeling they've got everything that the world tells them they need and there's still a gap in their lives. And Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, of course. And oh, what a relief there is when we come to the Lord Jesus and find right now by the Holy Spirit, there's rest to be enjoyed in him. Verse 10, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work. What a relief that is. What a relief for the religious. Maybe you were religious before you were saved and you were feeling that you had to do something to get right with God. And it's utterly exhausting. There are two kinds of religion in the world. Most religions are two-letter religions and the two letters are D-O. Here's what you've got to do. And you're constantly striving, trying to climb ladders, go to church enough or temple or mosque, say enough prayers, give enough money, do enough good deeds, and you never feel you've done enough. There's only one four-letter religion in the world, D-O-N-E, done. What's been done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ? And once we realize that we'll never do enough, but Jesus has done it for us as he lived the perfect life and died a sac sacrificial death and the burden has been lifted, what a relief it is. Lay your deadly doings down, down at Jesus' feet, says the old hymn. It's a wonderful thing to find rest for someone who's been striving Rest for the religious. Rest for the insecure. And how many are insecure in any social setting, desperate to be liked. And if I'm insecure in that kind of way, I'm always worried, will people like me? I'm tr trying to say what I think you want me to say. And after the conversation, I'm replaying it in my, in my mind and thinking, oh no, I can't believe I said that. What do they think of me? I can never, of course, totally open up because I'm worried you won't like what you see inside of me, and so I've got to be rather superficial. So the irony is I desperately want real intimacy, but I can never get it because I've always got a mask on, because I think you might not like the real me. And what a relief it is to come to Jesus Christ and find that he knows me absolutely. There's nothing secret from him. He knows me and he loves me, and he doesn't walk away in disgust, but he comes towards me and dies for me. Amazing rest for the insecure. Rest for the perfectionist. The one who lives, lives by achievement and is constantly trying to be better, 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 better. I heard of someone recently who was watching the athletics on television. And it was the high jump. And she said to a friend, I can never understand why anyone would want to do the high jump. And her friend said, why do you say that? She said, because whenever they... They, they manage to get over the bar, it gets lifted. She said, that was my childhood. My parents gave me these goals all the time. And whenever I seemed to be able to get over them, they just raised the bar. I never was able to say I've done enough. And there are many people who live with that kind of perfectionism. They even bring it with them into their Christian lives or even their Christian ministry. And they live by achievement. 
And what a, a relief it is to be told that my identity is not defined by how successful I am in the eyes of the world, in my working life or in my church life. But my identity is as a much-loved child of God. And that, that identity doesn't change whether I preach a really good sermon or whether you think my sermon is terrible. It doesn't change my identity. What a liberation that is. And here's this glorious present rest that we can have in Christ right now. But the burden of this passage is of a rest that is still to come. Chapter 4 and verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Sabbath. Ultimately, the fulfillment of Sabbath is still to come. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns and we're brought into his presence in the perfect new creation and there's complete shalom and peace and harmony and those perfect relationships that were enjoyed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, fully restored. Relationship of human beings with the world around them, of human beings with one another, human beings with Almighty God. So there's God's Sabbath rest described in four different terms. There's deep biblical theology here, isn't there? Let's move now to the urgent appeal and see how the writer of the Hebrews takes this psalm, Psalm 95, and what it teaches about the rest, which was in the Garden of Eden and then partially in Canaan, is now enjoyed in part in Christ and will be fully realized in the future. And let's see how he, he applies this message. And what he's saying is, don't miss out. Don't miss out on the glorious Sabbath rest that is still to come. I'm going to pick up, as we draw to a close, on three phrases. We'll spend a, a moment on each. As this wonderful truths, these truths are brought to bear in our lives. First, chapter 4, verse 11. It's the concluding application. Let us, therefore... Make every effort to enter that rest. A friend of mine had been in ministry for, for many years. He had about five years left, and then he got terminal cancer. He was told he was going to die. He had a few months of life left, and I had the great privilege of interviewing him at a clergy conference. And I said to him, look, you've been going now in ministry for a long time. You've come to the end of, of your life. What do you want to say to the rest of us? still in ministry. And he replied just using two words, stick it, stick it, meaning stick at it, keep at it, keep going, persevere. When I was younger in ministry, I didn't really think I needed that message. I'd been in ministry for about two or three years. I was at a clergy conference and the, an older minister said, would those who've been in ministry for 30 years or more please put their hands up? And various hands went up. And the man speaking said, you younger ministers, look around you. You're looking at miracles. And I thought to myself, they're not miracles. They're just old. <laughs> I've now been in ministry 29 years, and I realized that was right. It's, it's taken a miracle to keep me going this long. I don't take for granted that at all. And I don't presume that I will stick it and keep going to the end. And this applies not just to Christian ministry, but to Christian life in general. I need the help of God. And so the appeal is very relevant. Make every effort to enter that rest. Make sure you keep going. Now, some people are un uneasy about some of the, the appeals in the writer of the Hebrews, sometimes coming with strong warnings. And they think this undermines the teaching that the Bible clearly, in my view, states elsewhere, once saved, always saved. Didn't Jesus say, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. It's a glorious truth. And at times the Bible gives us that encouragement. Maybe we desperately need that at, at, at a particular moment. We're battling hard in the Christian life. We're clinging on, but it's so hard and then we need the encouragement. Listen, God says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I'm going to hold on to you. We need that assurance. But other times we need the challenge. You see, this wonderful truth 
of the assurance that comes to those who belong to Jesus, that ultimately it's his hand and hold on us that matters more than our hold on him. The danger is that could breed complacency. And there are those who would then think, well, I put my trust in Jesus at a Billy Graham rally 25 years ago, so I'm all right. I don't have to worry about today. And that's when the Bible comes with this challenge because true faith perseveres. The true believer keeps believing. How do I know that conversion was a genuine conversion 25 years ago? Well, it's seen in my life today. Make every effort today to enter that Sabbath rest in the future. Chapter 3, verse 14 is a striking verse. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. It feels almost when you read that as if he's got his tenses muddled up. But what he's saying is if you're not trusting today, there's no evidence that you truly trusted back then when you first professed faith. As the great late lamented Jim Packer once said, the sign of past conversion is present convertedness. The question is not, did you believe and trust yesterday, but are you believing and trusting today? Make every effort to enter that rest. Keep persevering right now. Which leads to the next application. It's essentially all one application, by the way, but just expressed in different phrases. You'll see it on the outlines there. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It comes three times, chapter 3, verse 7, and then again, verse 15, chapter 4, verse 7. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. There are two days that matter, today and the last day. And today is the, make sh is the day to make sure that I'm ready for that day. As I hear his voice, and today, don't harden my heart, but today, respond with repentance and faith. It's one of the glories of our Anglican liturgy that it's words soaked. And there's this encouragement of a daily pattern of coming under the word of God. But it's not enough just to hear it read or to read it ourselves or those of us who are clergy to preach it. That's not enough. It's not just are we hearing it, but are we heeding it, listening to it, allowing it to mold us and to change us so that we live in the light of it. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart to the commands of God. I remember hearing someone in a sermon apply a message by saying, when was the last time that what you heard in the Bible changed your life? It's a challenging question, isn't it? Am I allowing God's word to shape me in the attitudes of my heart and in the way I live my life allows it to correct me and rebuke me where I need to be corrected and rebuked? And how tempting it is to, to just say, well, that little sin, oh, I don't have to worry about that. I'd never do that. I'd never cross that line. But that little sin, that's all right. But that's the moment to deal with it when it's an acorn before it grows and grows and grows and becomes a massive oak. And then it's very, very hard to deal with. And maybe in these, these days of reflection, as we've engaged with God's word, you, you've heard a clear message of challenge. Don't harden your heart. Speak to a friend. Write it down. Pray. If necessary, repent. Don't harden your heart to the word of challenge, but also to the word of promise. That was the word, I think, that in the book of Numbers, the people of God in the wilderness hardened their heart to. They were unbelieving. God had promised he would protect them. God had promised he'd take them into the promised land, but they didn't really trust him. So they hardened their heart. And we need to receive and delight in the gospel. And how dangerous it is, it is when we take the gospel message for granted and cease to be excited by that and get excited by other things rather than continually marveling. Again, it's one of the glories of the liturgy, daily confession, daily absolution, daily reminder of the gospel promises. Our liturgy is not only Bible-soaked, it's gospel-soaked. It's gospel-shaped. Let's never harden our hearts to the gospel. Let's learn to thank God daily for the wonder of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done for us and all that we have in him and our hope guaranteed through him. 
Don't harden your hearts. But, and here's the last verse, encourage one another daily. Chapter 3, verse 13. Encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Oh, sin spread lies. It says, oh, try me. It'll make you feel better. God doesn't mind. He'll understand. He won't judge. He won't judge you. Now encourage one another so that you don't give in to sin's deceitfulness. We travel through the wilderness to the promised land, to the Sabbath rest, together, not as lone rangers. One of the dangers of these COVID times where we're not seeing each other so much. Let's never get used to this. Praise God for technology. I can speak to you from miles away, and that's better than nothing. But let's not settle for that in church life. And let's even now do as much as we can of real relating, even if we have to rely on technology a lot. And as soon as we can, let's get back to meeting together so that we really know what's going on. It's one of the hard things I find about COVID. I don't know what's going on very much with close church family members. I need to, to work hard to find out so that I can obey Romans 12 and mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice as we share life together. And as we share life together, we need to encourage each other and spur each other on, sometimes challenging, but often encouraging. I can preach the gospel as I'm doing now. I can apply the gospel to people pastorally. I often do that. I'm very bad at applying it to myself. And I need Christian friends very often to remind me of the gospel. When I've sinned, to remind me that I'm forgiven in Christ. When I'm tempted to live for some kind of idol, it could be perfectionism, it could be security and being liked by others. I need the gospel to challenge me. When I'm discouraged, discouraged because, as many of us feel, I'm going against the tide and it's so exhausting. And I feel weird and strange because everyone else is worshipping in that temple of individualism or materialism or pluralism. And even those in church life and in denominational life, still me and the Church of England, are compromising. And it's so exhausting to keep on going down some kind of back street and get the disapproving stares. And how tempting it is just to compromise. And we need the encouragement of our brothers and sisters to persevere, delighting in the rest we already enjoy through Christ by the Spirit right now and looking forward to the wonder of the Sabbath rest that we'll fully enjoy in eternity. The best is still to come. And so, my brothers and sisters, keep pressing on. Let's make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience of those in the wilderness generation. May God bless you richly. I'm going to close with a prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the Sabbath rest that already we enjoy in part in Christ by the Spirit. Help us to live in the light of what we've received. And help us to live, look forward with hope to the glory of Sabbath to the full in the future, when at last we'll be fully home. And spur us on to live now, whatever the cost, in the light of that reality. For Jesus' sake. Amen.